Jesus. Good morning, everyone that's joining us from the waiting room. We are letting participants come in now and we will get started shortly. Thank you for joining us. Good morning again, everyone that's joining from the waiting room. We're just letting a few more people in and we'll get started shortly. Well, good morning, UC San Diego staff. My name is Bryce Besser, and I'm the chair-elect of your UC San Diego Staff Association. On behalf of the Staff Association and Human Resources, I'd like to welcome you to the first Cabinet Conversations of the new year. Cabinet Conversations is a series of conversations with Cabinet members, and it's designed to provide staff the opportunity to get to know them better on a more personal level, and also hear what our leaders have to say about some important issues that are impacting our campus. It really came out of your requests and the Staff at Work survey, our uh, Council for UC Staff Assemblies Engagement Survey and the Idea Wave campaign that was part of the Staff Association Executive Board Strategic Plan. Today's webinar features Dr. David Brenner, who's the Vice Chancellor of UC San Diego Health. Before we begin our program, just wanted to go through a few housekeeping items. Uh, number one, we are recording, so you should see that up in the box there. Um, we will make the recordings available on the Staff Association website as soon as we can after we conclude. It usually takes a couple of days. We received a number of questions from staff before today that we'll be asking Dr. Brenner. And so, um, but for those of you who haven't submitted questions, you can do so today ver um, through the question and answer function. The moderators are moderating these questions and so they can uh, shoot them over to me. And if we have time, we can try to get to them. Um, we'll probably have an abbreviated schedule today. We might go a little bit less than our uh, uh, normal allotted time to accommodate Dr. Brenner's schedule. He has another talk after this. Um, so if we're not able to get to your question, the Staff Association will save those questions and we'll see if we can get them to Dr. Brenner or the appropriate department for an answer. So with that, I want to welcome Dr. David Brenner to the conversation. Um, Dr. Brenner, you've, you've given me permission to call you David, so I will, I will do so. So David, uh, how are you feeling today? I heard that you actually got your second shot today, your second vaccination. That's right. First of all, thank you so much for hosting me. This is really a great thing for you to do, and I, I really appreciate it. Um, so um, I did not plan this so well. I, you know, at the first available time when it was an open slot, I got my second dose of the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine. And as everyone predicted, I got fever, arthralgias, myalgias, <laughs> aches and pains everywhere. And um, so I'm not my usual um, chipper self, but <laughs> I, I am very glad to be here anyway. <laughs> so thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us. And, and if you're not your normal chipper mm -hmm. self, well, I mean, I don't necessarily know how you can be more chipper. You're looking great. We really do appreciate you carving out the time to talk with us today, uh, especially after something like getting your second vaccination. So, um, you know, if you need a moment, let us know and we'll, and we'll definitely accommodate that. But again, thank you so much for, for being here today. Um, one of the first questions that we typically like to ask of folks is, you know, how have you been doing in general? How have you been spending your non-work time right now in the season of social distancing? Um, can you kind of tell us a little bit about what you've been doing and, and if you've got any hobbies, fun hobbies you'd like to share with us? Well, um, this has been a difficult year. I mean, it's been a difficult year for us all. And um, particularly those of us at universities who are used to interacting with colleagues and friends, it, it, it's very different. It, and um, sometimes you lose a little bit of touch of reality when you spend all your time Zooming and you forget when the last time you actually saw someone in real life because <laughs> you see them uh, Zooming. And, and it, it's, a, it's a very different um, interaction. So, so I've tried to adapt. I, I, um, for example, um, I used to travel a lot for, to give talks, to give lectures, and that completely stopped. 
So now I, if I'm a visiting professor somewhere, I do it by Zoom. So instead of spending, you know, four days going to China to give a talk and coming back, I can give a talk by Zoom, you know, for an hour and then go back to work. That, that's, I think we'll still do things like that. I think there are some silver linings, you know, that we're going to learn to do some things better. I do miss, for example, my only hobby really is going to the gym and that stopped. So my big <clears throat> concession was that I bought myself an elliptical. So now I have an elliptical in my garage and TV. So that's as close to a gym as I get. But I, I miss the social interaction, just seeing all the people I've seen in the gym for the last 15 years. So, so it, 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 it's very difficult. And um, I think we have to be um, alert to that, that, that we can start getting um, withdrawn and, and we can start getting burnt out. And I, I think that's very important. It's very important for physicians, healthcare workers, it's important for all of us to take good care of ourselves and, and, and be alert to that. So I, I think that, that it's something that we really have to put at the top. And I don't know if we're gonna get to this, but one of the favorite things I've done is to um, help set up the um, Sanford Institute for um, Empathy and Compassion. I don't, I don't know, are you familiar with that at all? No, please tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. So a year ago, Denny Sanford, who's a noted philanthropist and businessman, um, recognized that um, there was a lack of empathy and compassion in healthcare. A and it reflects, for example, physicians are not looking at their patients anymore. They're typing, you know, you know, into the electronic health record and they're not getting the sort of interaction that they used to get. And the other issue was that um, physicians are suffering from burnout, even before COVID-19, just the normal wear and tear of modern medicine. And he told me that he thought that was an important topic to invest in. So we worked together with some other people on campus, including um, Bill Mobley, who's a neuroscientist. And we came up with a proposal to try to understand the biology of empathy and compassion and how you teach it. And the goal is to make physicians better to start with medical students and then to go to practicing physicians and to teach them skill sets to, to help them um, take better care of themselves and take better care of their patients. And he made this enormous investment. And it, it was really, we, who would have predicted that we'd have needed it so soon with COVID-19. So we have offering multiple different types of um, programs to help um, physicians and other healthcare workers to take better care of themselves. You know, everything from meditation to um, online interactions, the courses. And um, I, I think that, you know, it's another example where, where the university has been able to use its strength to take good care of its faculty and staff. So that's yeah, the, that sounds... the Sanford Institute. It, it, hopefully, you know, it just started, but I think the ball's in our court to do, to do great things with it. Yeah, and like you said, another silver lining, right? Another way for us to uh, be connected, even if we're not together, right? And and so perhaps maybe I can kind of cut to one of the other questions that I had a little bit further down on my list, but I think it fits in here is, you know, with the with modern medicine right now and the pandemic, telehealth, telemedicine has been predominantly, I think, how many of us have, have talked with our physicians. And so can you talk maybe a little bit more about, um, about the telehealth aspect, but from the perspective of um, how is the School of Medicine kind of included additional trainings or, or otherwise for our students, knowing that this is a primary way for people to, to talk to their physicians and it's likely going to be here for a long time after the pandemic. I could see this still being a, a valid way for us to talk to our physicians. No, I think that's exactly right. I think that's another silver lining. For whatever reason there was, I don't know, this, there was a concern about telemedicine, about that it wasn't as effective as in-person medicine. And, and I think actually that in some instances, telemedicine makes it easier to take care of someone. And so I think one of the things that will persist after COVID-19 is done is that there'll be a substantial amount of telemedicine. When you are looking at your, um, um, your drug list, when you are reporting on your blood pressure, you should not have to drive half an hour, find a place to park, wait a half hour in the waiting room, for three minutes with a doctor and then go back. It's so much easier to, to be able to, in a secure environment, to be able to have the five minute discussion and be done. 
and, and, and I think that that will become part of the future. Another part will be of what we call um, either digital or wireless health. That there's a lot of data that you don't actually have to go into the um, hospital, the clinic for. You can get very accurate EKGs at home. You can get very accurate blood pressures at home. You can get very accurate glucose levels at home for diabetics. So, so you can get all this data, share it with your physician, usually you know, you know, through some sort of Bluetooth you know, um, app, and, and then discuss it by, by telemedicine. And I think that will um, become part of medicine and it'll make it more efficient. So instead of only checking your blood pressure once every three months when you go to see the doctor, you can check it every day and have that data and have an, an analysis and, and go over it with your doctor. So telemedicine is clearly gonna be uh, one, of the, one of the advances. And it really just took, unfortunately it took a pandemic for us to get over the, over the hump that we, we, we could, you know, physicians tend to be very um, conservative and not change that quickly. And, but um, for a while, you know, 90% of our, of our, um, of our um, interactions with telemedicine, we think it'll settle somewhere around 25%. So, so maybe 25% will be these sort of short interactions. And the other times you need, to, you need an exam <laughs> when, when you need to, to have a serious long-term discussion, it, you'll be able to do it in real time. But, but, but a lot of it can be done by telemedicine. So, so I think that's a big advantage. Yeah, and I mean, I can only imagine, you know, some of those things that you were talking about with the Stanford um, initiative um, is, you know, the empathy and that sort of thing that, you know, can get lost perhaps. I guess one of the, again, silver linings is that we've been forced to practice medicine this way. And so our physicians, our, our uh, school of medicine students, right, they've been, they've been learning on the job, right? They've been learning through training on, on how to kind of uh, be a great physician in that medium, right? And so that they're still being able to give great patient care. Yeah. So for, for these students, it, it's, it's um, complicated. Initially, we did not know what to expect. So we took the uh, medical students off of the wards and just did, you know, telelearning. But, but then we realized it's not right, that, that this is their careers. And, 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 you know, so now they're back integrated with the healthcare teams. They're all wearing you know, PPEs, you know, um, personal protective equipment. And they are like any other member of the team, rounding on COVID-19 patients, rounding on other patients, and they're back integrated. But, you know, we learned because initially we didn't know what we're dealing with. And, and, we, and there was also a, a PPE shortage. So we were very concerned and it took us a while to adjust. So, so now most of the didactic sessions are done um, by Zoom, done online. And, um, and then all the clinical um, interactions are back to the way they were before, but with now with the addition of PPE. So that, that was the adapt, you know, it took us, you know, half a year to figure it out, but, but, but now we're back. And I, and I think the students are better because of it. I think they, they realize, you know, how, um, you know, precious life is and, and, and how things can change in medicine. When I trained, it was HIV AIDS. I mean, that, that was completely new when I, when I was a medical student resident. And it, it was also very scary, unknown, and, and students, I think, are better off because of it, because they're fully integrated in the healthcare system. Yeah, well, that's really, that's really good to hear. I mean, I'm sure that, that the learning experience is much better for them and um, they're developing their skills to be, to be great physicians. And so that's wonderful. Um, how, if at all, I mean, how has the pandemic kind of impacted um, the medical school in terms of enrollment? Are, are we seeing numbers up? Are we seeing numbers down? And, and also, I guess, kind of tied with that is, what's the morale like for our students? Are we seeing uh, folks that are really engaged and energized? They're ready to kind of come in and fight the good fight against, you know, this pandemic? Um, are, are some folks also feeling a lot of burnout, like you've been talking about? Can you share a little bit more information about those types of things? I think... The students are very energized by this. They see how important medicine is for society. Um, um, I, I don't know if I mentioned to you, but on Friday I was um, in uh, Petco Park giving um, vaccination and um, the, um, the, the students really want to participate in this. So we, we have to figure out how to integrate them into, into the whole healthcare system, including giving vaccinations. But, I think they really see how important their, their, their function is to society. Um, the, the part that I'm concerned about is, is the isolation that we talked about earlier, that, that if they're doing so many things on Zoom at home, you know, um, 
for example, um, I teach these, um, we, we, we try to change the curriculum from um, lectures to more case-based learning, and problem-based learning, the groups of about 12. So when I'm facilitating a group like that, there'll be you know 12 of us um, students and I will try to get the answers out of them and we'll interact and it's really fun. Um, but this year, of course, I couldn't do it in person. So we did it by Zoom and it's not the same. I, I just, I just uh, you know, want the students to treat each other as colleagues, interact with each other, to help each other. And it, it just doesn't work as well by Zoom. So when this is all said and done, you know, I'm looking forward to, you know, to meeting with the students in, in real life and, 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 not, not, and, and not online because it, it really, um, um, we missed a little bit, but we did adapt. I mean, so, so the, the, the things, the, the didactic sessions are now completely by, by Zoom, not in person. You know, it's safer, and um, but hopefully next year we'll be able to have a more hybrid system where things that are like packaged lectures be done by Zoom, but the interactions of small groups be done in person. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to see kind of what the next few months has in store for us. And first of all, I want to thank you for being down at the Super Center and <laughs> vaccinating people. That's awesome. Um, I had a chance to take my wife down there recently. And who's a nurse and you know the, the volunteers down there is top notch i really appreciated everything they did yeah everyone's in such good spirit it's so much fun. <laughs> every everyone the the, the the people getting vaccinated are so grateful and the volunteers are having such a good time because they really they're really making a difference it's very much the more people you vaccinate the safer we're going to be it, 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 and so you have everyone you know all different types of people who can back say you know, nurses and surgeons and everyone you know, is, is, are out there helping and directing traffic. It's really, it's really fun. It's really a lot of fun. Yeah, it's it's awe inspiring. It's basically what I could say. Yeah. It's just everybody is committed to the same thing, and that is you know vaccinating close to five thousand people a day. I mean, yeah. it's just it's just an amazing thing to be able yeah. to participate. Everyone's checking the numbers too because the five thousand is a magic number. When I get over five, so we just missed it the day I was there. We're just like forty eight hundred. So everyone's trying to get to five thousand. Yeah. So we kind of jumped into our conversation. I wanted to take a step back because I really do want to give staff an opportunity to, to know more about you as well. So can you share uh, with us a little bit of information about kind of your career path at, at, at UC? Yeah. So if you're perceptive, you probably realize I'm not originally from California. <laughs> I have a classic New York accent. So I was not born here. My son was born here when I was a fellow because he's the only native Californian in the family. Um, Anyway, so I, um, I um, trained um, back east um, at um, Yale National Institute of Health. And then in 1985, I came out here almost as a dare to be a gastroenterology fellow at UC San Diego and to conduct research. So this is the first time I ever lived, you know, um, um, west of the Hudson River and, um, and came out and loved it here and got trained and started my research. And then um, in um, 1993 or something, I got recruited to be chief of gastroenterology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, and that's um, where my children grew up. And um, I developed uh, interest in both um, research, but also just in leadership and mentoring and how you build academic health systems. And then after being chief of gastroenterology, I went to Columbia University in New York to be chairman of medicine. And um, after several years there, the um, previous chancellor of UC San Diego said that um, if I behave this time, I can come back and to be, uh, to be vice chancellor and, and dean. So in um, 12 years ago, I returned from, um, from New York. So it's quite a, quite a big difference between New York and La Jolla and, um, and um, started back here. And um, I, what I noticed was that um, there was a lot of um, things that had not changed since I left. So like the, 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 um, the medical education curriculum hadn't changed that much. The, um, we were still uh, mainly based in Hillcrest Hospital where my son was born. <laughs> and um, that, that there was a need for an infusion of um, new resources, new buildings, new programs. So over the last 12 years, um, we've built 12 buildings. So we, we, we built a building a year. So you, you probably have noticed the campus completely transformed. 
everything from Jacobs Medical Center to the Oldman Clinical and Translational Research Institute you know, to the um, Sanford uh, Medical Education and Telemedicine Building, and um, and recruited a whole group of um, physicians, physician scientists, and really um, key thought leaders in the field. So, you know. Um, I've always felt the reason I came out initially was because of the incredibly strong research. And I always felt that the, um, the clinical care, the clinical infrastructure um, needed to be as good as the research. And, and, and that was my goal when I came back. And, and now I think it's spectacular. I think that, you know, we, we always say we have three missions. We have um, um, medical education, um, research and patient care. And my goal is to not to just develop all three, but to have them synergistic so that the, the hospital is better because you have great students. You know, the research is better because the hospital is doing well. You know, the, the, and, and that they, they all interact in a way to, to make, make it better. And I think that's the, um, that's the secret sauce of academic uh, medicine. There are very good research you know, institutions, but they don't do clinical care. You know, they're very good you know, community hospitals, but they don't do research. So I think that, that this is our sweet spot and um, to have all three missions interacting. So it's really, I, I'm just so lucky that let, they let me do this. <laughs> I'm always amazed. They really let me build a new hospital. They really let me build a new laboratory. And um, I, I think what's going on here now is, is as good as it gets. I mean, I really feel like we, we are at the level of the very, very best institutions in the world. That we, and in many ways, um, we are a leader in some of these things. And uh, I think, um, one of the good things that came out of COVID-19 is how we were able to use all the strengths of the university to, to, to take good care of people. You know, and um, for example, we always had a great clinical laboratory in the hospital to do testing, but that was insufficient to do testing for the entire campus but to together do thousands of, of COVID-19 tests every single day. So we built a, a, a separate lab built by the researchers to be able to do this enormous number of tests to, to keep the campus safe. And, and I, that was amazing. These, these are people who are not set up to do clinical testing. They use all their strengths as, as researchers. And in BSB, right across the hall from my office, where I am right now, there is a pop-up laboratory that's doing thousands of COVID-19 tests every day to keep the place safe. I, I, I'm sure you've seen this. One of the most incredible things was having these little dispensers, you know, these uh, where anyone could pick up a COVID-19 test, test themselves, you know, um, um, barcode in their, 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 the test, get the result next day and, and keep and, and be able to really monitor the campus. Another example is the um, we test the wastewater coming out of the buildings. No one else does that. You know, and, and you can anticipate that a building might, you know, have people who are infected before they actually know they're infected by, by testing the wastewater and then interrogate that building and find out what's going on. So, so that those are sort of really high level research um, approaches to a public health problem. So, so I, I couldn't be more proud of the staff and faculty to figure out how to do this. And I, I think in many ways, we're the safest, most advanced campus in the United States. Yeah, the work that's being done is amazing. I mean, getting the alerts and just understanding that how we're attacking it from every yeah. angle, it definitely gives someone like me hope that mm -hmm. if, if we can make it work, then a lot of other people are going to be able to make it work as well. One of the questions that just came in through the question and answer I thought would be very important, and, and it highlights an issue that we typically kind of touch on in, in these talks, and that is, can you articulate health science's commitment to student diversity and anti-racism? Sure, that's very important. Well, let me just say one step back and just explain how health sciences works, it's just, just one sentence. So, so you probably know this, but there are three academic units um, at UC San Diego. There's the general campus, there's marine sciences, the strips oceanographic, and there's health sciences, which is us. Health sciences consists of the three health science professional schools, the School of Medicine, School of Public Health, and, and the School of Pharmacy, the, the hospitals and clinics, and the faculty practice. So, so, so as opposed to Yale and Columbia where I trained, um, we, um, we are an integrated healthcare system. The hospital and the medical school are all under one office and interact. And I, I think that's much better. So we can do things other people can't do. So with that, um, especially after um, 
you know, the um, murder of, of, um, of some um, black men and the um, Black Lives Matter uh, movement, we really took a step backwards and said, what are we doing to make health sciences more welcoming, more diverse, you know, more equitable? A and um, we recognized that there were some um, intrinsic problems in the system that, 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 that were working against us. I mean, some are really obvious. I mean, we're not in, as opposed to Columbia, in, you know, an integrated urban setting, you know, with a lot of diversity. So, so you have to be very proactive to do that. And, um, and others were that if you follow the usual way of recruiting people, you will not have a diverse um, um, workforce. You actually have to be proactive and, and find amazing people from diverse backgrounds and be very positive about this. And so, so, so we identified several areas where we could do better. And I think you know, one of our biggest breakthroughs was the School of Public Health has, um, has recognized this as a, you know, as a national and international problem and has made it one of their themes that, that, that um, racial justice is intrinsic to public health. And, and by having this additional school, we're able really to build on this. So, so what have we done? A um, couple of things. First of all, for recruiting students, we use a holistic uh, way of um, recruiting. It's not simply um, done by, um, numbers from tests and numbers from you know GPAs and things. It, it's holistic looking at the entire student so you, so you can take into account different people's backgrounds to make to, 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 as, as part of, of building a more diverse student body. Um, second, and I'm very proud of this, um, Joanne Trejo, who, who is our, um, um, our um, assistant um, vice chancellor for, um, for, for faculty um, um, development, uh, who is actually an old friend of mine from University of North Carolina, <laughs> Um, she, um, she has identified <clears throat> a really sophisticated way of recruiting outstanding faculty from diverse backgrounds. So the way we usually recruit people is we pick a topic, like in my field, hepatology. You know, we, we, we get, you know, 20 candidates, 30 candidates, we interview them, maybe one or two are from a diverse background, maybe not. And then statistically, we'll almost never get someone from a diverse background. Just playing the odds, it just won't happen. What she said is we're gonna look for candidates from diverse backgrounds, independent of their, of their area of expertise, and then, look, and, then, and then put them into the right department. It's completely, it's a paradigm shift. It's completely different. So we did this last year. We found five amazing people from, from all over the country and we recruited four of them. We lost one, <laughs> we lost one. It was, so instead of going like 0 for five, we went four for five. It, 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 was, it was transformational. Okay, so, 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 so we're gonna do that again next year and we're gonna keep doing that. And the last thing was really championed by, by uh, Cheryl Anderson, our new Dean of the School of Public Health, the work on the School of Public Health. She has developed a program um, to educate us in, um, racial justice. So we looked around and the, um, our colleagues at the University of San Diego, you know, just down, down, you know, downtown San Diego, had a very strong um, program and we asked them to bring it to us. So, so I actually took her with her. She and I were, were the initial class. We enrolled together. So it was um, two hours for fr um, every Friday for five Fridays. It was a pretty, pretty big commitment you know, over the course of a month and a half. And um, we, they were very, the teachers were very tough on us. They really, we read about areas of, of um, you, know, um, you know, inherent racial injustice and how you can slip into things. They showed us vignettes of people, you know, um, 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 how they approach different things and how you can slip. And, 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 then, and then we would, we would break the small session and we really quiz each other about how we interpreted it. So, so, so the goal is that every single person in the School of Public Health it's gonna go through this. So we do 30, 30 per session. Yeah, each session is, you know, is, is, is over a month. And then over the course of the year, every single member of the new school will go through this. And so that was a model of the School of Public Health. And we challenged the School of Pharmacy and the School of Medicine and the health system to the exact same thing. Not, not that this might be the perfect fit because there are lots of good people who know how to do this, but that every single school and the health system is committed to, to doing this. 
And the last thing is we created two new positions, which are completely new. We never had anything like this. We're currently recruiting right now an assistant vice chancellor for um, equity, diversity, and inclusion for the health sciences and a, um, an administrator in the, um, in the health system to also look at issues. There are very specific issues about the health system and, and, and um, you know, um, concerns about um, harassment, about um, um, protecting the rights of others that are unique to health systems. So we want an expert in that. And then we want a scholar to be an assistant vice chancellor to, to both teach us how to do better, but also to use um, um, the health sciences as a, as, a, as a living laboratory so that, that, that we actually practice what we preach. We actually apply this and, and see how we do and, and treat it like any other, you know, rigorous best practices. You know, you know, you intervene, you measure it, you see what you see what the results are, you know, and, and then you do it again. And, and so I would like to approach this with the same rigor we do any other scientific discipline, you know, that we get, you know, the very smartest people working on this, that we publish in this, that, that we practice it, and, and that we and that we become a model for other health systems that have to do this well. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, thank you so much for really trying to think outside the norm, right? Because that's what it's going to take here is we understand that it's going to take some big movement. And um, that all sounds really promising. So uh, I know that many of us will look forward to hearing more from all of those different aspects, you know, as we move along in the next few months, it's really a vital thing. So thank you so much for, for helping spearhead a lot of those initiatives. Um, That's very exciting. I mean, it, and, and I think, and I just think UC San Diego, the people are very entrepreneurial. They're very um, creative, you know, and it's, there are a lot of things that are done by you know, by, you know, junior faculty and staff to make it a better place that that would not really be encouraged in older East Coast places <laughs> like Columbia and Yale, right? <laughs> so I know that um, we, we were going to try to let you out a little bit early because you do have a, a, a busy schedule today and you're giving another talk. If you wouldn't mind me asking maybe one or two other questions. Of course, no, 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 we're good. So um, one of these would be about the health talk events you're giving later today. You have a health talk event. Can you tell us a little bit more about those talks um, and, you know, no spoilers, but I mean, can you just give us a preview of, of some of the types of things that you might be discussing later today? So this was also a reaction to um, COVID-19. We used to, before this, we used to like go to a resort or somewhere in the evening and, you know, and try to introduce um, the community to what we're doing at UC San Diego Health Sciences and, and pick a topic that might be interesting, anything from diabetes to nutrition to you know cancer prevention um and uh, we can't do that anymore we, we you know we're not able to do that and i and i miss seeing people so this was you know do the really hard work by the uh, our you know our dancemen our development people they said well why don't we do this online why don't we do this at lunchtime you know and and let whoever's free come join us for a topic and we'll just discuss what people would like to hear about so, so it, it, this was, again, I think a very creative reaction to a very bad situation of COVID-19. And it turned out, we, you know, we would get maybe 50, 60, 70 people to, you know, to, to cocktails at night, but we get 200 people when you can, you just turn on your Zoom and, and participate. So actually we're reaching more people and, and we try to, to ask what would people like to hear? What would people in the community like to talk about? So of course this year, of course, it, there's been several on COVID-19, everything from you know, the, 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 the lung manifestations and, and, and how people get sick and recover to how we're doing with our um, COVID-19 screening, the testing, how we set this up, like this pop-up lab I told you about. And today's is of course, the topic of the day is vaccinations and how we're getting people vaccinated and, and what are the bottlenecks and, what are the rules and how do we decide who gets vaccinated today and who gets vaccinated tomorrow? And, yeah, and there, are two, um, there are two vaccines now and their technology is brand new and hopefully there'll be a third one very soon with completely different technology. And what does that mean? And, 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 and how, how protected are you? And if you don't have symptoms, can you still be infectious? So there, there are all these questions and we're so lucky to have such amazing scholars in this field. You know, infectious disease experts, vaccine experts, public health experts. You know, and so, so 
it's really a great opportunity for community to learn. And, and particularly, some things are a little theoretical, and you know, not, you know, maybe you're interested, maybe not, but everyone's interested in vaccination. Everyone wants to know, you know who gets vaccinated when and, and how and what, what the results are. So we, we will go over our own experience. You know, so we are um, vaccinating rooms <clears throat> called 1A, which are um, healthcare workers and, and people over 75. And then the state of California extended that to people over 65. And then we have several places where you can get vaccinated on the campus or at Petco Park, as we just discussed, and, and, and who gets vaccinated where. And then some drugstores are starting to offer vaccinations, but not others. So it's a very complicated system, maybe, maybe more complicated than it should be, but I think everyone's intentions are really good to get as many you know, people vaccinated as possible and to scale it up to, as we're discussing, to 5,000 a day at Petco Park, that was unheard of until a couple of days ago. So people really adapted and figured out how to make things work. So that will be, I still want you to call in to, <laughs> later today. I don't want to lose my audience, but that, that, that's, that's what we'll be reviewing. And we'll hopefully show some interesting data about um, how, how San Diego's been doing, how the state of California's been doing, and how the country's been doing. Yeah, definitely, and and I would encourage folks to to log in as that as well. You know, um, to look it up and, and register if they haven't already registered. So I just wanted to <clears throat> try to give a little bit of a preview and acknowledge that you you are doing another speaking engagement today, and so I wanted to be mindful of that. Um, there's so much more that I could ask you, especially about the broad portfolio that you oversee. That was one of my other questions. In the interest of time, though, I think what I'll what I'll do is try to end it with maybe one final question. And, um, and then hopefully we'll be able to have you back in, in a future session because there's so much that, that I'd love to talk to you about and I know that other folks would like to, to learn about. Um, so, you know, you hint, you, you discussed how, um, you know, our healthcare workers and we've seen it firsthand, you know, from all of the professional schools to those that are working on the front lines against COVID, you know, are, are really facing um, things that they haven't had to face in their lifetime before. And so the stress and the strain are real. Um, you know, from the staff association, we always try to remind our staff that we are interconnected, that folks down at SIO and folks at Central Campus and folks over at SCAGS, et cetera, we're all one UC, we're all UC San Diego. So with that in mind, what type of advice or things can you, can you recommend for those folks that aren't in the health sciences? What can we be doing to help support those that are in the health sciences right now? Uh, I mean, the... The, the most obvious thing is to practice good um, public health discipline. <laughs> I mean, it, it, to take care of yourself, you know, to wear a mask, to, to wash your hands, to practice social distancing. Um, so, so, so that's the most important. The other, the other is that of all the places I've been, this is the most collaborative and, and, and interacting. A, a, and there are lots and lots of opportunities for people um, from the different parts of the campus to interact with each other. And I think that's really one of our strengths. I mean. One of the things I always go through, um, like an exercise in my mind myself, is like, what can we do that other people can't do really well? I mean, so, so for example, for those people at Scripps Institute of Oceanography, I think about environmental health and the ocean and you know, how you know, the health system and the oceanographic institution can, can actually create you know, a better environment, a better, you know, safer environment and interact. And I, I would just encourage everyone to do that, to sort of look around them and see, what else is going on in campus that, that, that to be interested in? And, and as opposed to many other places, there seems to be very few barriers to interacting. For example, I mean, the most obvious one is if you want to go down and pick a park and, 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 and help um, vaccinate, they're, they're always looking for volunteers. You know, that's something you do today, but that's just one small example of the opportunities across this campus to, you know, to build a more uh, you know, inclusive, diverse, um, community and, um, and I think people here treat each other very well. I think, I think it's really I think it's really a wonderful you know system and, and that we're, we all should be you know very proud of being part of it and, and each in our own little way you know trying to make it a, a better place. So so we've learned a lot from the stresses of uh, COVID-19 and I hope we emerge even better. I mean not, not, not that we just not that we return to normal but that we actually are better because of it you know and um, and, and take good care of each other. So I think that that would be my, um, my take home message from my colleagues. And I, and I really, I wanna thank you. I really appreciate this opportunity to talk to you and hopefully we can do it again sometime soon. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Brenner. David, yeah. thank you so much <laughs> for, for joining us and, and being a part of it. Like I said, there's there's other questions that I have in the interest of time, though we'll, we'll go ahead and stop here. Um, the conversation, of course, can continue. And we would love to welcome you back and have you again. So um, we'll, we'll reach out, you know, in the next coming months as we're, as we're going through things um, to see how we can make that happen. So for those that are joining us um, to the webinar, that is all the time that we have today. Um, again, want to thank David, Dr. Brenner, for taking the time and speaking with us and sharing his insights and a little bit more about himself. It's always great to, to really be able to see our, our leaders and learn more about them. Um, the Cabinet Conversations team is continuing to plan out the next set of Cabinet Conversations. So please uh, check your email and keep an eye out for announcements for um, the next guest that will be joining us. You can go to the Staff Association's website to, to view this and our prior Cabinet Conversations. Again, this one will be up hopefully within the next few days. It takes us a little while to get them up, but you can go to the staffassociation.ucsd.edu website to find prior cabinet conversations. So until next time, thank you all for the amazing contributions um, to our campus. And uh, I really just want you all to be well. And until next time, we'll see you then. Thank you.